Hi there, how's it going? In today's video, we're going to rip apart a long-held fallacy that has been manipulated and that has been twisted by Brexit-loving numpties, especially over the last six years. We're going to separate fact from fiction in what some of you may think is very cold-blooded, but quite frankly, following some recent announcement, I think it needs to be hammered home with as big a hammer as possible. So let's go. Now, over the last few days, we have heard how a letter from Mr. James Ransbotham, the CEO of Northeast England Chamber of Commerce, to Boris in his number 10 mansion, more than a, I think more than a fortnight ago, still remains unanswered. And in his letter, he stated one thing that stood out to me. And it was, and I'm quoting here, our ports face the EU and our region has the highest proportion of any exporting to the EU. It is vital that more barriers come down. Now, there's little surprise with that, with the call for the barriers to come down. But with some investigating, the findings we discovered are a lot more troubling than we first imagined. Now, just a little bit of back, background. Rapid industrialization first began in Britain, starting with the mechanized spinning jenny in the 1780s. And with, with it came high rates of growth in steam power and iron production. And that occurred after the 1800s. But mechanized textile production spread from Great Britain across her empire and to other nations around the globe over the following decades. This incidentally was the main contributing factor, that mechanization was the main contributing factor that fueled the economic development of the British Empire. Now, but let's, we won't digress too much. From the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, try as they may to match the expansion and the development of the mechanization, other European countries simply could not compete and they were unable to capitalize on their own colonies nearly as well as the UK could. They also watched how the British Empire solidified its colonies as they were at the same time losing control of their own. Now, but they, they didn't give up and they didn't sit on their laurels either. There was, but there was no way in hell any other nation would have been able to hold a candle to the British Empire in the early Victorian years. To go against her would have been suicide. But all that changed. And the people of the UK need to wake up and face some really hard facts. And I'm going to be giving them here. They need to choose to believe that they were wrong. Just as easily as they choose, chose to believe the propaganda of the post-war years. They chose to forget that without the US and the exceptionally brave stance taken by the men, taken by the women and children of the UK, Europe would have become a fascist state. Of that, there is little doubt. Anybody who argues against that is talking rubbish. But thankfully, that did not happen. And for that, we should all carry some measure of gratitude. However, ironically, that's when things really started to go downhill. And they went downhill rapidly. European manufacturing facilities that had been basically levelled, while the UK's heartland of production remained relatively intact, began to emerge from the ashes. If you fast forward just 30 years to 1976, the landscape had changed dramatically. Why? Because successive British governments failed in the most extraordinary fashion possible. That's the reason. As early as the 70s, Japanese cars began to arrive. Instead of being examined and recognized for their engineering prowess, they were ridiculed. They were dismissed as recycled Coke tins. Japanese electronics suffered similar derision. The government, the media, and the various industries were all in step, were all in line, all in denial, all shoving this propaganda out. But you know what? When you turn the key in those cars, those engines, they started. It might rust the hell, but they started. The radios worked. They had radios in them. But that was all ridiculed. 
And that is exactly what's happening again, except this time there is no place to hide. Why? Because we're going to give you the facts. We're going to tell them to you in barefaced facts. And here they are. The northeast of England was once the powerhouse of the English manufacturing industry. And unfortunately, it is still seen as such. This is an illusion. The northeast of England may be the biggest part of the UK for industrial output, but it is by no means British. It isn't even close to British because we've looked at the top 50 companies in the northeast of England. Only 14 of those top 50 are British companies involved in manufacturing of goods and software. The rest are foreign owned companies, public service companies, or property and retail outlets. These companies don't bring the the jobs at manufacturing industry and these companies make up just 17 and a half percent of the rest of the production values of the northeast of the top 50 17 and a half percent out of the top 50 okay now what needs to be made completely clear is that scientific advancements comes from two sources only two sources and they are universities and large private industry AstraZeneca is a prime example. That vaccine came about because of Oxford University and AstraZeneca. And therein lies the lesson to be learned. And it needs to be hammered home. AstraZeneca's office and research facilities are not in Oxford. They're in her main rival in almost every faculty from rowing to astrophysics. Cambridge University. That's where their offices are. But if you were to try and find the UK government comparison in a foreign policy, be it in trade or otherwise, where they move and they're watching instead of depending on old methods, I guarantee you the only thing you'll be met with is obstinate and imperialist attitude that wasn't appropriate in the 20th century, let alone the 21st century. Thankfully, it's not too late to rectify this. The UK has some of the best universities on the planet. The bang for book invested in universities is the highest gross in return of any other in the OECD. And that's according to Professor Brian Cox, whom we all know, but what you may not be, in, be aware of, his field of expertise in the CERN project is analytics. He knows how to decipher figures. And he's also discovered that PhD courses in science subjects has fallen by more than 38% over the last 20 years. In every other country, they're rising. Now, and the hard facts are simple to grasp, but here, they're, here they are. The UK's exit from the EU means that we now have to pay to be part of Horizon at a cost of 1 billion, rising to 2 billion by 2023, represents 25% of the UK's total research and innovation budget of 8.5 billion, which we believe is also going to get cut. So they can cut that budget, but they can't cut the other one. Now, in order to participate in Horizon next year, the government has had to pledge an additional 250 million to the research budget and is reallocating previously announced sums to supplement it, which will be merely a stay of execution. Without more funding, the impact on UK research will be deeply damaging and it will be felt for a generation of researchers. And let's not be naive about this. You know, after years of investment in their future, many of the best young researchers are being and will be forced to leave the UK for jobs elsewhere in R&D. The chances of them returning are almost zero. But I'm going to leave you with this thought. There was a very famous um, astrophysicist called Carl Sagan, an American and a brilliant commentator. And he said correctly that society is entirely based on science. Society requires engineering and technology solutions to continue and to prosper. If the UK continues to go on this path of isolation. There are perilous dangers ahead. There are very few advancements 
advancements rather, that are not created by people that have participated in third level programs. It just doesn't happen. You don't get men on the moon without seriously intelligent and highly qualified people. You don't get those advancements in engineering. Alan Turing, everybody knows who Alan Turing was, but Alan Turing was a professor. He was a smart dude. There are some very small examples of people who didn't, who achieved great things, but they didn't come out with magnificent new processes that push the industries ahead. They're brought out by the university's research labs. That's where it all starts. You know, from silicon chips to graphene technology, it starts in the universities. And unless and until the British government wake up, smell the coffee, get their ass back in to the single market, back into the customs union, the UK is going to get left behind. It is already being left behind in education. The educational standards in the UK, third level, is dropping. There are less people attending university. If I compare it to Ireland, 62% of those under the age of 30 are in third level graduates. 62%. The UK isn't even close to it. It isn't even close to it. So guys, please get on to your local MPs. If you've got something in your own area that needs to be highlighted, I don't care if it's they're not collecting bins because they've run out of money because of Brexit, get it to me, we'll do something about it. We've got to get this government out. They're going to kill the UK and Europe cannot afford to exist without the UK. The UK brings balance and it's required. We need the UK back in the EU and the EU need the UK more than equally as much. So thanks for listening. See you on the flip side.